Thanks again for joining me on Sealed for Good and today we're talking about a topic which comes up a lot with both waterproofers and building designers and that is roof gardens. They are becoming a lot more popular now. I think for the last 15-20 years we've seen the growth of them in commercial buildings particularly with designers and architects for a number of reasons but we are starting to see them now in larger domestic dwellings and they are taking place over conventional builds. They are filled with all sorts of things from uh, basic soil uh, retention, shrubs, bushes, various plants, and we even see some sort of uh, ground covers being used within uh, roof guards because they can be used as external areas, particularly in high uh, density homes where it might be a shared area now you see in some apartments where it is the the old traditional backyard. So what are the advantages of roof gardens? Well, when you talk to designers, the motivation behind them obviously is to optimize space, but there's the energy efficiency, which is number one, uh, in terms of reducing the heat absorption to buildings. It's a great way to control heat. And also it retains warmth within the building during winter months, which is really important. The low carbon footprint is the big motivation behind a lot of designers wanting to, to incorporate roof gardens into buildings. It is a far more efficient use of rainwater. I know we don't have water shortages at the moment, but I remember years, a few years back when virtually every state in the country had water shortages, it was a big topic. You do get a far more efficient use of water, which is important. And the one thing that designers uh, will confirm, but we often forget when we're in the um, other construction phase of design, is the actual acoustic properties. Big benefits with roof gardens for acoustic properties of um, buildings and homes. Now, typical construction of a roof garden, it's a concrete slab, a suspended concrete slab, and it needs to be engineered to handle the weight loadings. You've got to remember two things here. This is not like a tile finish or pedestal pavers. You've got earth and soil which is heavy in weight. So those slabs need to be designed to incorporate and handle those sort of weight loadings. And the second thing that's important to remember is the actual retention of water. Water weighs, and it's not like water just evaporates, it's retained there for a while. And so it's really important that that design takes place. Now I've seen a couple fancy creative people wanting to use things like Hebel um, on roof, you know, home, home design roof gardens in lightweight structures. Nothing I've got against Hebel or lightweight structures like cement sheet and sky on but they're not designed with a uh, timber joist structure to handle those sorts of weights. So if in doubt, if you're a waterproofer and you, and you have to waterproof a roof garden that you might have doubts about, it actually can handle the conditions, get it signed off, don't be the victim of actually putting a waterproof membrane down thing and you're doing the right thing and then it falls into shit basically because the fact is it can't take those loadings. Really, really important. Design in these areas is important. This is probably the one of the most challenging applications outside of water tanks and swimming pools for a membrane application. So, what are the challenges with the waterproofing piece? Well, you've got high volumes of water, which we mentioned, and the water retention. So, that creates stresses on the uh, underlying membrane. It's constantly damp, so you need to make sure you've really got something that can handle immersed conditions. That's how we would treat it from Gripshed's point of view. Once these are sealed, and they're filled, you've got drainage cells, you've got blankets, you've got earth in them, and then plants. If you've got a leak, this is really challenging to then on how you're going to fix that, and it's costly. Everything's going to come out, and that's going to bring in landscapers, it's going to bring in a major cost for a whole lot of uh, things you can actually store while you're doing the corrective work. You know, you try and store trees and shrubs and bushes because you don't want to replace the cost of them while the repairs are going on, and then you expose the roof of the building, uh, which could be during winter months. So make sure you get it right, flood test first, which we'll go into a little bit more uh, later. And the other piece on the challenge is the destructive bit on plants in terms of their roots. And that comes down to, I talk about landscape architects, landscapers, and asking the question as a builder and a waterproofer, the types of plants that are being put in, have they got roots that are gonna be quite disruptive, or are they roots that are actually um, less disruptive. So you're not going to go and plant a gum tree on a roof garden even though the bloody thing might be big enough to hold that because roots of those sorts of trees are going to be damaging. It's a roof garden. It's not 
a national rainforest. So make sure you, you select the, the plants and the items that are used inside that are selected for that. A lot of times now we see grass and greenery, but you still do get a lot of landscaping plants that are used. They've got to be to the point where those plant roots are not going to be destructive on the membrane. So what do you consider in a membrane system being used for roof gardens? Well firstly, as I mentioned earlier, this is a challenging application. From Gripset's point of view, we would always specify a system virtually can handle immersed conditions. Something that can handle continuously damp environments is going to be critical because this area will never get any sunshine on it. That membrane will always be in contact with water 24-7, so really important. The next piece, it needs to be a system that has anti-fracture properties. Okay? You can't just go and use a liquid membrane system and hope for the best, even though it might have high elongation and good crack bridging properties, because the fact is, this is an environment that's got weight loadings on it, and those are stresses on the substrate, and is likely going to get some sort of hairline movement, whether it be hairline cracking, or it could already be incorporated with joints within the structure to handle and allow for movement. So really important that you've got an anti-fracture system that you've taken to, to consideration and a membrane with really good abrasion and root resistance. Now there are a number of root resistant membranes on the market, there's root resistant toppings you have, but there's a lot of good uh, high abrasion membrane systems that have in their sheer nature good root resistance and that's going to be critical. Remember the roots actually like things that are soft, so some bitumen surfaces that have got a softness to them, that's where the roots of plants will find their way in and that's when they start to um, compromise the, the membrane system. So really important on that selection. Key requirements. This is, a key, this is a real important piece on what you look for. Firstly, uh, this is an area that's going to drain water away. It's not designed to be a swimming pool where it holds water. I told you that, that the area will always be wet, but it's important that it drains water away. So the slab should be uh, constructed with a fall or there's an allowance in the detail for a screed to be, to be applied within the waterproofing system, either before or after, to enable the drainage to uh, happen and falls for, for water to, to drain away. Really, really important. Um, you know, there are things like drainage cells, geotextiles that you're using. There's some great designs now that companies have had that they've taken to the next level with helping garden beds and planter boxes and roof gardens drain water away make sure they are utilised in the design. Now you might be the waterproofer and that's not your piece, it's the landscaper's piece, but ask the question. It should actually be shown on the drawings as well because these are things that are going to come and compromise your work later. You don't want to get called back in a year's time because there's issues that happen to the membrane. Ask the question up front, it's a good conversation to have and it also shows that you know, know your stuff and what you're talking about and gives the client something to think about as well. Gripset's piece on this, our recommended system, we use our Gripset GC2 system. It's a waterproof sheet, high performance, anti-fracture. We use it with our new uh, GC Pro 2 adhesive, which is waterproof in its nature itself. They can handle waterproof conditions. It can handle any um, negative hydrostatic as well, which is a key to it. So great if you're even using it on, damps, on a damp uh, slab or damp screed as well. And we use our elastic-proof bond breaker system around the perimeter as our Bond breaker for the Gripset GC2 system and depending on how high the walls come up we might utilise a sheet or we would put a high build heavy liquid system over the top of that for the, for the uh, wall return but more often than not we would treat it almost like a planter box with a sheet. And then collars, our elastic proof collars you're seeing on screen now, really critical because of the rupture and the stresses around pipes in those conditions. We always use the elastic proof collars to protect those pipes and drains from any stresses on the membrane so they remain sealed for good. And the other piece is we use Gripset C1P or our Gripset 11Y slurry coat over the top of the sheet for two reasons. A, it gives it a final seamless finish. Secondly, they're root resistant because of the abrasion resistance. And thirdly, both those systems can handle full immersion all the time. We walk away from there knowing that the system we've installed could handle water. Even if there's a blockage in that drain, the, the membrane system itself can handle constant water sitting on it. So that is our system on that. Membrane checks. When you've finished your application, and this is for even our building friends that are, that are involved here, ask your waterproofer, or the waterproofer should offer this, a flood test before any landscaping work's done. Get those drains blocked once the waterproofing's done, 
flood the area and ensure that it's holding the water for 24, 48 hours at least and ensure that if there's any areas that have been compromised, they're picked up, they can be repaired prior to the backfilling uh, or the, the uh, landscape application. Because as I said, once that earth and those drainage seals go in, there's no uh, pulling them out unless you really want to get a lot of stress. So the due care piece is really important with the mechanical damage, making sure that you've got things like your drainage seals when they're applied down and all the landscaping that goes on top, that there's some drop sheets in place to protect the membrane because you've got, even though you've got a, a protective system like I mentioned before, like our 11Y or our C1P over the top of the GC2, you don't want people walking around with wheelbarrows wheeled around onto a membrane system. There needs to be uh, drop sheets in place, protective layers down, so that membrane is not in contact with anything except for what it's designed to handle, which will be the, the uh, drainage blankets, the drainage cells, geotextiles, etc. And also when things like loam and stone is installed on site, it's just not dumped onto a membrane system. It needs to be put in place as designed. Good landscapers will help you with this. If everyone's alert to it, we work together on site, get the optimum outcome, and roof gardens will be functioning as designed, waterproof, and all the things that the designers want out of them, that's how they serve their piece. Happy to see some photos of any of you doing roof gardens out there, throw them into us, looking forward to that. Till the next episode of Seal for Good, I'll see you next time.